think this the, the, the story is kind of like that average story. I don't know. I think five years old was the first time I told my parents out loud that I wanted to be an artist. I can't say what I was inspired by or anything. I just knew I liked making stuff and I liked moving my hands and I liked creating images out of thin air, which was what it felt like at that age. It's like I can think or see something and I can translate it on paper. Because I'm autodidactic, because I am self-taught intentionally, I have chosen the medium of fresco. So I've taken it and I've sort of modernized it, put some different materials in it to help it survive, sustain, and live outside of the walls of the cathedral. Take plaster, I pigment it, I do months and weeks of layered paintings on top of another paintings, on top of other paintings until I build a, a history that I could then excavate and carve back through, or sand back through, or wipe back through. I think it's very important for me as a, as a black queer woman to show up fully as who I am with confidence. I work from a very honest place and my identity is gonna show up in my work. And when it showed up by accident, it was cool. It, I knew about it, but then I realized that I could reach more people and that more people could see themselves and then more people could learn about themselves and then more people can be proud of themselves and have a little bit more to celebrate about um, if visual arts is that space they want to celebrate. HSPVA saved my life. I was born in New Delhi, India. I, I studied very hard. I was, um, you know, I had the goals to be a doctor and I did art on the side all the way through like AP art and all of that through high school. And it took me a little while to figure out what con what my place in contemporary art was because again, I, I didn't get exposed to uh, people of color, women of color in the arts. So I'm happy to have work in these spaces where people can feel like they can really show up as themselves and they can queer people that look like me can show up and feel ex feel proud of it feel excited about it i've never um, thought of myself as like being a role model for this kind of thing but it's like oh i i think i am and i think that's kind of a, a really cool place to be i think about my work as um, my body my lifestyle as a decolonizing of of everything that I've ever ingested. Right now I'm really focusing on making these self-portrait paintings that put my body back onto the mats and repurposing the mat. The yoga mat that we see today is is not an Indian creation, it's like a European creation. So I am taking that and using it as my surface to reappropriate the mat myself for my own benefit. And I'm really enjoying making these paintings <laughs> as a way of uh, preservation too. They started during COVID last summer. So I've just been really into myself on the mat. <laughs> <laughs> I specifically chose Mark Bradford as the artist to focus on because you just know he just lives that that black queerness that you can that that's palpable that you can just you know taste and touch, and he, it comes across in the materials that he uses and the desperation of those materials. And also, I was a tenth grader in 1992 watching the riots, and so that piece takes me right back to there. And then I'm so satisfied knowing that an artist took that moment and made a permanent piece. It's like placing this history in this moment in a museum and forcing people to remember, to put it back together again. It's just marvelous to me. I feel often that I'm straddling different identities uh, depending on where I am. So that's where a lot of like this torn back and forth feeling often comes from. So I completely understand and can relate to where uh, Jeffrey Gibson gets a lot of that tension in his work because I feel a lot of that internal tension. The punching bag especially, uh, all of me wants to just punch it, but it's so beautifully adorned. It is covered in bells mm. and beads and it's so beautiful. So it becomes an, an object that's of beauty. But then it's like that kind of tension you have with that object is often 
the, a kind of tension that I feel and try to emulate in um, my works that have to do with beauty. Two Dykes and a Knife started when we started dating, basically. We were long distance for the first two years of our relationship and we connect a lot over food. So like me, with my background that you've learned a little bit more about in this video and Lovey with her very different background and upbringing as well, it's just incredible what being at the dinner table can do for connecting people. So we thought that's, that's really the seed of where uh, two decks and a knife came from. We want to create dialogue and to get people talking. And I think that the easiest way or one of the easy ways to get people to let their guards down is to put a, a fork in their mouth. It sort of neutralizes the space, it neutralizes the table. And I think that if people can choose food to talk about rather than things, the things that are going on in the world, you can start finding the things that you have in common.